and you know, uh, had some, well, welcome back. I think we're, rec we're recording again. So welcome back and very excited um, to be uh, presenting the last panel, um, what, which would be, has been a really amazing conference and um, uh, just so many, so many great presentations. And I think, uh, I think we will all, all enjoy uh, the final um, four papers uh, reevaluating um, Fellini's films. Uh, so we're going to go in the order uh, that is listed on the conference. So uh, Giovanna um, will be going first. So let me just make sure she's here. Hi. Oh, yeah, you yes. are. Yes, you are. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Great. Okay, so Giovanna Lucena is a um, PhD student at the Department of Italian Studies um, at the University of Toronto. Uh, Giovanna was awarded her Honours Bachelor of Arts with high distinction from the University of Toronto, completing a double major in Italian and European Studies and a minor in Spanish. Her areas of interest span across a broad spectrum of topics in Italian studies. However, she is particularly drawn to Italian cinema, specifically neorealist films and the works of Federico Fellini and Giulietta Messina. And Giovanna is passionate about discovering small things that fill our spirits with joy and happiness. So I will uh, turn it over to uh, Giovanna and I'm very excited to hear your paper. Thank you very, very much. And first of all, good morning to all of you. And I would just like to extend my sincerest thanks to Dr. Whitehead for the lovely biography and uh, also to Professor Don Benedetti for inspiring me to write this paper. And I'm gonna go ahead and attempt to share my screen. Let's see if this works. Okay, are you able to see the screen okay? Okay, here we go. The rise of, tele of commercial television in the 1980s Italian society completely revolutionized the medium's meaning and purpose. One Federico Fellini heavily criticizes in his 1986 film, Ginger and Fred. In my discussion, I will provide suggestions of how Fellini uses his protagonist to provide a prophetic warning about the destructive effects commercial television has on televised films and television audiences, while emphasizing his nostalgia for avant spettacolo and the dying art of cinema. To do so, I will first present a study of the roles Fellini's protagonists represent, both in the film as his self-portrait and concerning Fellini's oeuvre. Then I will examine three of Fellini's notable criticisms of commercial television. The film is told through the point of view of Amelia and People, who represent old cinema culture as they embody the nostalgic memory of avant spettacolo and cinema through their participation in the new uh, commercial television world of a decovoi. Fellini shows how the old and new begin to clash. In many ways, a million people seem to arrive from the variety light stage, recalling the mother-wife figure of Melina Moore and the irresponsible childlike adult, Keko Del Monte, from, from Fellini's Variety Lights. They, not they are not only continuations of Fellini's earlier films as an ongoing creative project, but also represent his perspective towards postmodern mass television culture. Hence, it becomes evident that together, the qualities of a million people form Fellini's self-portrait. On the one hand, as Tullio Kezic explains, Amelia, in the beginning of the film, trying to feel her way through the world that doesn't belong to her, is a self-portrait of Fellini, shy, curious, vulnerable, impatient, angry, determined. Her shyness and curiosity are best exhibited through the scene where Amelia looks between the blinds in her hotel room at a television tower. An establishing shot of Amelia looks, looking out the window cuts to a close-up of her eyes looking between the blinds with curiosity and uncertainty, almost in awe of this object that is seemingly foreign to her. The camera pans from the bottom of the television tower to the top, taking the point of view of Amelia's eyes. Once the tower is circling spotlight, the scene cuts to a close-up of Amelia's eyes, looking at the same direction the camera was fixed on, all the while accompanied by a piece of non-diegetic, eerie music to emphasize the statement, the sentiment rather, of an unknown world. The scene confirms that Amelia's and the camera's eyes are the same, thus representing the author's point of view, that of a sense of estrangement in the postmodern world. Her vulnerability is showcased through the belief that she will be able to restore the past romantic, nostalgic world with her partner people. At its core, the nostalgic element throughout this film is best defined by Svetlana Boehm, who states, 
Nostalgia is a sentiment of loss and displacement, but is also a, a romance with one's own fantasy. A cinematic image of nostalgia is a double exposure or superimposition of two images of home and abroad, past and present, dream and everyday life. The moment we try to force it into a single image, it breaks the frame or burns the surface. Amelia's impatience, anger, and determination then arise from the clash between the old and new worlds. She hopes this experience will magically recreate the memories of her youth dancing with her lover. Defined by Boehm as reflexive nostalgia, as it dwells on the ambivalence of human longing and does not shy away from the contradictions of modernity. At the same time, Amelia also embodies restorative nostalgia in her attempt to recreate a lost home, hence the stage of variety lights. This type of nostalgia does not think of itself as nostalgia, but rather as truth and tradition, meaning it manifests itself in the total reconstructions of monuments of the past. Amelia further personifies restorative nostalgia through her frustrations with the show's production staff and cast, their lack of care, professionalism, and art, which she was so accustomed to earlier in her career, hinders her ability to reconstruct her past. As a result, Amelia symbolizes Fellini's ambivalence toward television, as she admits to an irresponsible fascination, irresistible rather, fascination for the medium, but who is scandalized by the tacky and unprofessional preparations for the show. On the other hand, Amelia's peep, um, partner, People, represents the director's most conciliatory qualities, lucidity, self-irony, and tolerance, while displaying the synthesized characteristics of the Mastroianni character. He continues to represent the author's alter ego and perpetual male infantilism, exhibiting the constant need for a mother-wife figure while simultaneously desiring a lover figure, qualities he finds in Amelia. Moreover, the costuming choice is intended to reference the same outfits worn by Fellini. Just the same, Amelia's costuming coordinates with peoples, not only making them look like they belong to the 1940s, but also resembles the plaid coat and cape worn by Melina in Variety Lights. This aspect of the mise en scene refers, uh, further reinforces Amelia and people as Fellini's self-portrait and a continuation from Fellini's past works, as opposed to merely being an imitation of old Hollywood stars. Such a distinction leads to the author's first major criticism, distrust for television as a result of its simulated reality and moral leveling. Fellini inserts a flood of imitations to take part in the container show. The first encounter with imitation occurs with him when Amelia steps into the van and notices two Lucha Dalla lookalikes. She is in awe of how closely they resemble the original. In the same sequence, a mini television inside of the van shows a Dante Alighieri puppet lost in the Selva Oscura reciting the opening lines of Inferno. The puppet distorts the original lines to promote a compass watch that helps him find his way. The commercial thus appropriates and distorts Dante's masterpiece, ignoring the message of his literary pilgrimage while creating a reduced simulation or better simulacrum. Jean Baudrillard uh, explains this concept, stating, simulation is no longer that of a territory, a referential being or a substance. It is the generation by models of a real without origin, a hyper real. By recreating a simulacrum, Fellini emphasizes commercial television as a new reality for 1980s Italian society, not deriving from any previous version of itself, revealing how this new type of reality lacks the humanistic, fantastic, dreamlike elements that play an essential role throughout his films. As Franco Galippi explains, Fellini must myth mythologize commercial television to detoxify its soullessness. The author achieves this by inserting a million people into this world as they embody a generation that has not been entirely suppressed by modern technology. They project the director's estrangement to the postmodern world while being ambassadors for the humanistic elements strongly projected throughout Fellini's works. Hence, the contrast between the human component brought forth by the film's protagonist and the imitations further emphasizes the element of hyper-reality and invokes moral leveling. Television culture, as Millicent Marcus states, works not only to provincialize, but to reduce all its personalities to the same cognitive level. Fellini gives all his characters equal time slots to perform on the same main stage, mixing the talented with the talentless. He mimics how television networks fill in the gaps with diverse content to maintain the spectator's attention, reducing all performers to the same basic level. 
In doing so, he communicates his distrust for television as it fails to communicate significant message. Guy Debord develops this concept of media and culture, stating, and I quote, as culture becomes completely commodified, it tends to become the stark commodity of spectacular society. The task of the various branches of knowledge that are in the process of developing spectacular thought is to justify an unjustifiable society and to establish a general science of false consciousness, end quote. Therefore, the simulacrum of television culture creates a new passive reality, one which no longer desires nor renders necessary the conscious transmission of a message other than that related to consumerism. With the adoption of this new culture, society reduced the divide between artists and common people. The old variety show is distorted by inserting irrelevant acts and creates a new type of program designed to serve a different purpose. Its concern is no longer to produce an artistic spectacle for the pleasure of viewing, but instead aims to retain audiences' attention to promote a greater number of commercial products. It is evident that Fellini's most severe criticism is towards the disruptive and destructive qualities commercials have on televised films and television audiences. Fellini despised how they would chop up films shown on television, including his own. He states, the continuous interruptions of film shown on private networks are an outrage. It not only hurts the director and his work, but the spectator as well, who becomes accustomed to this hiccuping, stuttering language and the suspension of mental activity, to a repeated blood clot in the flow of his attention that ends up turning the spectator into an impatient idiot, unable to concentrate, reflect, make intelligent connections, and look ahead. He loses the sense of musicality, harmony, and balance that are integral to storytelling. This, just, this disruption of syntax can only serve to create a race of illiterates on an epic scale. Fellini delineates the major differences that distinguish cinema and television as two distinct worlds with two distinct purposes. In doing so, he expresses the difficulty audiences have to concentrate on important messages within the storyline. Fellini imitates commercial culture by interrupting the love story's narrative during the show's chaotic circus-like preparations. This is particularly evident during the parking lot scene. Amelia and Pippo share brief moments updating each other on the portion of their lives not lived together among, amidst the confusion of the acts scattered around the parking lot. Shown through the camera's pan of the area, they must reduce their story to a brief summary before the camera cuts to their discussions and other goings on. The love story's narrative is interrupted, leaving no room for a storyline. Marshall McLuhan explains that most often, the few seconds sandwiched between the hours of viewing, the commercials, reflect a truer understanding of the medium. There simply is no time for the narrative form borrowed from earlier print technology. The storyline must be abandoned. Fellini replicates the attitude of television by making it difficult for audiences to follow along with the love story's narrative by breaking traditional cinematic continuity. Consequently, while emphasizing his nostalgia for the dying art by showing what television is lacking, he criticizes co uh, consumer television culture for its inability to transmit a meaningful message and thus one that can signify. The signifying message, however, in his film is transmitted through Amelia and People's Dance. During their performance, cinematic elements are made present and the nostalgia of the past is restored. It is a return to the memory of the theatrical variety shows while embodying past cinema. In comparison to other acts, Fellini's decision to show the entire performance is symbolic as it breaks the culture of moral leveling and hyper-reality of television. The director reclaims control of what the audience sees by abolishing the confines of television culture. The emotions invoked by their performance and reunion in general are finally able to be experienced. It is through this dance that Fellini achieves full mythologization. Of course, during Amelia and People's performance, a power outage causes yet another interruption. However, this interruption is an anti-commercial. As opposed to breaking the story into even more pieces, it attaches them. The, the television world ceases to exist for a few minutes, allowing the love story between the protagonists to reach its long-awaited climax. The director emphasizes that the circling light at the top of the tower, once rotating, has now gone quiet. The tower that powers the hyper-real society is now powerless. 
Compared to the earlier hotel room scene where Amelia gazes upon the foreign structure, the diegetic sound in this scene is quiet and natural, accentuating a return to a different reality. A crane shot shows Amelia on stage in a silent, darkened studio, her white outfit illuminated by a small light while the camera operators and television staff resemble silhouettes. This marks the transition from the television world to the nostalgic world of cinema, where the ghosts of the past come to life in the dark. Amelia, walking forward with caution, calls out to her partner Fred with a loud whisper. Calling Fred instead of people contrasts with a shot, reverse shot of people beginning to laugh and calling her Amelia, opposed to Ginger. This indicates their transformation back to their originals and complete entry into the real world represented by cinema alive only in the dark. During the blackout, people transfigures into the strongest rendition of the director's alter ego. After explaining to Amelia that the lights are not going to come back on, he gives his reasoning, stating, Primo perché è una organizzazione di il famoso gigante dei piedi d'argilla, e poi chi ci dice che non sia un'azione terroristica, uno dei soli attentati. Io mica escludo che da un momento ad altro, pam, soppiamo tutti per aria. Ah, Amelia, sarebbe una storia fantastica. Pensa che titolo. Si erano lasciati trent'anni prima e si ritrovano per morire insieme. People exemplifies Fellini's disgusted attitude towards commercial television while playing upon his own self-irony by inventing a concept fit for a film. Filled with the director's typical fantastic elements. People further explains that he feels comfortable in the darkness surrounding them in the studio. E come nei sogni, lontano da tutto. This statement brings to mind the concept of la vera vita e quello del sogno, from lo sceico bianco. Fellini therefore attempts to lead his viewers back to reality through a dream of cinema. The darkness reveals what would be considered as grotesque in a television-centered world, the nostalgia for cinema through the dimly lit faces of a million people. In its essence, the dance on stage is a successful prank as the television stage cannot produce art. However, the emotions rendered from their performance are a direct message of what cinema is capable of doing. Amelia and Pippo are set apart from the commercial television world. Therefore, they can only exist as originals in the dark, as opposed to the imitations living in the light. Grazie. Great, amazing, uh, just amazing job. Uh, Giovanna, here, I'm gonna give you. <laughs> Round of applause, and I'm going to introduce our uh, next uh, speaker, uh, Kevin uh, Bongiorn um, Bongiorni, who is um, the Lillian Di Felice and Sampson GPT Professor of French for Business and Associate Professor of French and Italian at Louisiana State University. Um, he has published articles and lectures on a number of eclectic subjects, um, including Federico Fellini's La Dolce Vita and Sofia Coppola's Lost in uh, Translation. Um, as well as the semiotics of cosmetic and plastic surgery and the legacy of the natural sign. Um, he has recently published two articles on study abroad and experiential learning, and his current research includes a book-length project on Fellini's La Dolce Vita. Um, thank you so much, and Kevin, you're, um, you are welcome to take over. <laughs> okay, am I unmuted? You were unmuted, now you're muted. Do I unmute it? There. Am I okay? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, thank you very much. I really, you know, I'm really sorry that I didn't get to come to Toronto. Um, but uh, I want to thank you for all the effort that you put in to make this work. Um, and um, this is a paper that I wanted to do for some time. So it was nice that it gave me uh, the occasion to to do so. What I'm going to talk about is I'm going to talk about boredom um, and La Dolce Vita. And 20 years ago, I, and I'm just going to kind of talk about it because it's going to exceed the time limit. Um, how much time do we have? Well, it's about 10 to 15 minutes. Okay. So. Okay. Okay. So 20 years ago, I was asked to take over a class on the picaresque and during that class, um, we read uh, the, uh, the Adventures of Augie Marsh, Saul Bellow's book. 
And there was a passage there, um, and I'll read it, that has stood with me. Um, Augie Marge says, after much effort to live up to a glorious standard, there came fatigue, wan hope, and boredom. I saw others experiencing it too, many denying, by the way, that any such thing existed. And finally, I decided that I would make boredom my subject matter, that I'd studied it, that I'd become the world's leading authority on it. Strange that no one had gone after this systematically. Oh, melancholy, yes, but not modern boredom. And that was in 1953. And after reading that, I put a post-it note in there, and it's been there for 20 years. Um, and when I started thinking about this, this conference, I thought this is uh, a perfect opportunity because one thing that has always stood out with me uh, in La Dolce Vita is in the, I guess, in the episode right after the introduction, uh, after we see Jesus being sent to St. Peter's, we're introduced, we cut to the, um, the club and we are introduced to Madalena. And Madalena is very rich. And one thing that stands out, one of the first things she says is how bored she is. Muscocho, she says. And that, be, that has really always stood out with me is just really how boredom is not simply uh, marked by Madalena, uh, but it also really marks the nature of La Dolce Vita. And so, uh, in fact, boredom uh, is La Dolce Vita. Now, Augie March says that, uh, that boredom had never been really systematically uh, examined. And um, it does have a deep history, but the history goes back to really sort of culturally, I guess, uh, or contextualized, um, it's, it's contextualized historically and culturally. So it goes back to antiquity and in the term Akkadia, which was, uh, was it was in the Greeks. It was picked up by the by the early church fathers uh, in Achedia, and it was considered the the origin of all other sins. This being detached from God, being uh, dissatisfied and bored. Um, later, it was picked up as melancholy, and then it was picked up as ennui in the nineteenth century. But really, boredom as we know it is a modern phenomenon. And, um, and so it came up, the, the word was beginning to be used in the, in the 18th century in the Enlightenment. And it's not surprising because um, there are three basic reasons that, that boredom comes about. And the first is with the death of God. With the death of God, we, are, we become, when reason has priority over, it replaces religion in terms of providing meaning or what happens is that we're detached from the world. The world no longer has an inherent meaning, um, but rather we have to fill that with meaning and the world then becomes empty in itself. The world is just there in its materiality, in its emptiness. And so, um, so that becomes the first shift is where God is replaced by man. Um, the second shift is, or this, uh, the other two elements that are involved in it as a modern phenomenon is industrialization and movement to the city. As people got freed from working on the land, they, and they went to the city, they found jobs in factories and in industry. And what happened was a consequence of that is that once their necessities were replaced, all they needed, then they ended up having a lot of, they had, for the first time, they had uh, free time, they had leisure time. And that, you, that made them aware of sort of like the emptiness, right? The nothingness that, that filled their lives. And so they had to replace it somehow. And that was really the beginning of sort of like the entertainment, of entertainment, of diversions, and it's not surprising that in the 19th century, the end of the 19th century, cinema comes into existence because it, it sort of like becomes, you, you, you need to escape in a way that emptiness and the nothingness that, that is at the heart of everyday modern existence. Um, and so 
let me get here. Um, and so what, as we get on, there's, there are, there end up becoming two notions of what boredom is. And there's, uh, there's situational boredom, which um, is specific to an event. And, and it's, the example is for my students, when my students are watching La Dolce Vita, we're watching it in my class right now. And as we watch it, they're wriggling in their seats, they're uncomfortable, they are you know, sneaking peeks at their phones, they're looking at the time, and boredom is about time. Time passing, awareness of time passing, awareness that time is, um, is, 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 well, with boredom, time is always present. And that's what differentiates it from melancholy, say, is that there's always a presence. We experience boredom in the presence. It's detached from the past and it's detached from the future. Um, and so, there's situational boredom and then there's existential boredom. And existential boredom is the boredom described by uh, Dino in Moravia's La Noia, where he's detached, where he finds himself, he says it's not, it's not the kind of boredom that you feel in, in, in divertimento, trying to, enter, to be entertained, but rather it's a fundamental detachment. And, and dis, you, a detachment, um, he says, from things and from other people. And he says, you know, it's a problem from uh, lui non ha nessun rapporto con il mondo, con gli oggetti, uh, con le cose. It's this complete detachment and alienation uh, from the world, from others, that is devoid of meaning. And so, um, and, and Moravia's book came out in 19, uh, I believe it was 1960, but it's something that is at the heart of, of modernity and, and modern being. Um, and, so, um, and so it's not any surprise, I'm, I'm just kind of going through this, um, it's not any surprise then that, um, okay, it's, it's not any surprise that La Dolce Vita would come out in, uh, in 1960, in when Italy became modern. It's a, it's a specifically modern phenomenon. And it's not a surprise that in 1960, Italy has gone through, they're in the throes of, of uh, their economic miracle. Italy's becoming an, an industrialized uh, powerhouse. They're urbanized. And so suddenly they get all the benefits of, uh, of prosperity, but at the same time, they also suffer from the same modern condition, which is boredom. They have to fill uh, their time. Um, and so it's no surprise then that Fellini would make a film, a three hour film that is a film of, that is boring and that is about boredom. Um, other, other things that are important about La Dolce Vita is the fact that um, that it is um, about tabloid, they're about tabloid journalism. It's no surprise that tabloid journalism comes up in, 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 in uh, modern Italy or in modernity because that is an opportunity to escape. There are basically three positions that we can take in relation to boredom. We can uh, seek to escape it, but that escape is always going to be fleeting or that escape is always going to be temporary because once you find something that allows you to escape it, once you're entertained, once you watch TV, once you watch a movie, you come back to, right, the reality that is the nothingness, the meaningness of the world uh, out there. And so what happens is that... Um, that you can that you can try to escape it, and this is what we see in La Dolce Vita: is we see there this position where all of the characters, the rich, the famous, the aristocrats, the um, you know the movie stars, is that through their episodes, what we see is we see people who are just really one-dimensional, people who are trying to escape their boredom by having parties, by staying out all night. 
And again, one of the interesting things about boredom is that there's a relationship between boredom and insomnia. And in La Dolce Vita, we see they never sleep. Um, anyway, um, we see the characters that he's covering are basically the characters are just constantly trying to escape from the boredom by filling it with empty uh, events and activities. The, the other th way that we can look at boredom is simply by accepting it, by being resigned to it. And we see that in the character of Madalena. Madalena, she, she is absolutely resigned to the fact that she's bored. Marcello says, why don't you buy an island? You have so much money. And she, she is so bored. She's too bored to even do something like that. And she just ends up having meaningless sex, staying at home, playing cards with her father. But she really has not even the energy to try and escape uh, uh, her boredom. Marcello is a little bit different because Marcello is he takes the third position where he is not trying to escape it and he's not comfortable with it either but at the same time he's seeking to say transgress it he's looking for meaning throughout the film and he's trying to transgress or to transcend the 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 boredom of everyday life but the problem is is that with boredom and these are the romantics have understood this, is that boredom is not defined. I mean, the meaning now lacks definition. Meaning lacks um, uh, articulation. Meaning is very hard to, they, you don't know when you find meaning. You don't even know what that is. And so Marcello, and this is part of Mar Marcello's adventures, is that Marcello goes through the different episodes of La Dolce Vita, he goes through the different episodes, but there's never really any progress. And in boredom, the perfect example of artistic representation of boredom is really the episodic stru structure, because it's a structure that goes somewhere, but it goes nowhere. There's no progression. You don't make any progress going to any, any, uh, any final point. And we have this, we have Marcello going from place to place, from episode to episode, and he doesn't even articulate that he's looking for meaning, but there's this dissatisfaction and that he's looking for something and that he fails to find it at every turn of the, every turn along the way. Um, and so in the end, and he believes that, and the other thing about the, the episodic structure is that it is always in the present. And that that's one defining feature of the um, of, of boredom is that it is always in the present. So in the end, Marcello believes that he may have found the structure. He may have found the meaning, right, with Steiner, where Steiner tells him that you need to live. He, he tries to encourage him to uh, to take up writing again. But he um, but when Steiner kills himself. That is the end of Marcello's journey. The idea that there's any hope, the idea that there's any escape from his boredom is, uh, is gone. And that's where his journey ends. And so I'm just gonna read the final, my final uh, paragraph. It would seem that Marcello's search is doomed, except for a glimmer of hope he finds in his conversation with his friend, the intellectual Steiner. Steiner encourages Marcello to abandon tabloid journalism for something more serious, to take up again serious writing. Steiner confides in Marcello and tells him that we must one day learn to love detached, distaccato. And that's one thing throughout that is defining of boredom is this fact, this idea of being distaccato. So Steiner's telling him about being distaccato, I think is, is telling. Um, from one another. Shortly after this conversation, all hope is lost when Steiner kills himself and his children, sparing only his wife. Marcello's search ends here. Marcello, Arthesius, has met his minotaur, and it is nothing. It is the nothingness at the heart of modern boredom. There is no escape. There is no hope. It can be neither transgressed nor transcended. One may only relent. This Marcello does 
finally leading his rich and famous friends to a villa on the beach where he serves as the ringleader of an all-night orgy, only to see the monster, Minotaur in himself, reflected in the eyes of the dead sea monster that has been dragged onto the beach by fishermen. In a final gesture of capitulation, he throws his hands in the air and waves goodbye at the final prospect of spiritual salvation offered by the beckoning young angel Paula on the beach. He can't hear her calls. He doesn't want to hear them. They are no use. No, in the end, Marcello Thesius simply gives up. Looking at us, the viewer, he turns his back and walks away. Arthesius has cut his ad, ar, has cut the Ariadne thread and leaves us without resolution to wander, wonder without escape. In the end, after three hours of our time fidgeting in our chairs, we, like Marcello, end up on the beach empty with no satisfaction, with nothing but the nothingness that marks our own boredom. Anyway, I'm sorry that it was so disjointed, but I wanted to make sure that I got through it in time. So thank you. Thank you so much, um, Kevin. That was really, really great. And um, I appreciate it. I'm sure we're going to have some great uh, Q&A um, afterwards. So our next speaker is Marco um, Albastillo, who is an EU uh, Murray Curie postdoctoral fellow at the University of Padua and the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. His research focuses on ecological issues in Italian science fiction and he has worked as a postdoctoral fellow at the Department of Italian Studies at the University of Toronto, where he was my favorite office mate. Um, and uh, he earned his PhD at the University of Padua. His book, The Conflict uh, Revisited, The Second World War in Post Postmodern Fiction is scheduled for pub publication with Peter Lang in 2021, and he is co-editing a companion to the Italian Gothic for Edinburgh University Press. Go ahead, Marco. Thank you, Jessica. Thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, now I will uh, share my screen so that you can see my very poor PowerPoint presentation, especially when compared with uh, uh, Giovanna's, but uh, here we go. Uh, now, Spectres of Venice, Fellini's Casanova and the Gothic. Uh, in this paper, I discuss the presence uh, of Gothic themes and topics in Il Casanova di Federico Fellini, and I will try to touch all the points that, from my perspective, make a discussion of Fellini's Casanova as a Gothic textuality appropriate. Uh, when we consider the Gothic in Casanova, we must also consider Fellini's often overlooked relationship with the Gothic filone in Italian cinema. And while Fellini's movies could hardly be considered uh, uh, Jean films, uh, there is a strong link between his work and the Gothic film industry. Starting with Toby Demmit in 1969, Fellini employed Bernardino Zapponi as a screenplay writer, a key figure in Italian horror and occultural scene. And for clarification, with occulture, oh, you can't read it all, can't you? Oh, gosh. Well, with occulture, which is a term coined by Christopher Partridge, I mean the circulation of occult themes and topics. Maybe this does help. No. Well, the circulation of occult themes and topics into subcultures and finally into mainstream culture, which was a distinctive part of Italian culture from the late 50s to uh, the 80s. Uh, the Zapponi, as is well known, uh, um, um, well, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to, well, I'm sorry about that. Zapponi, as is well known, uh, wrote the screenplay for Dario Argento's Profondo Rosso while working with Fellini, and Fellini himself was deeply interested in both popular culture and culture, especially after uh, Eight and a Half, and he initially hired Zapponi specifically for his knowledge of these topics. Now, Zapponi and Fellini's first collaboration, Toby Demmit, is a great example in this sense. Toby Demmit partly pays homage to, the, to Gothic cinema, and the movie explicitly quotes cult author Mario Bava's Kill Baby Kill, also known as Operazione Paura, which came out in 1966, as both of them present the devil as a young child, using extremely similar stylistic features. And a nod 
to the Gothic genre is also represented by the choice to adopt a story by Edgar Allan Poe, a writer that epitomizes the Gothic and was often present, present in Italian horror at the time. And for instance, in Antonio Margheriti's Danza Macabra, Poe does not only appear as a source, as the source of the story, a fictional source since, you know, uh, the movie is not based on any particular story by Poe, but, but also as a character. And the homage to Bava in Toby Demet is certainly due to Zapponi, because as Roberto Curti suggests, um, he admired Bava to the point that at the time when he was editor of the magazine Il Delatore, he announced a special issue entirely dedicated to the director, uh, which, a project that was uh, shelved due to the mags unfolding. Now, what has this to do with Casanova? Of course, Casanova is not traditionally considered a Gothic figure due to the general diffidence towards the Gothic as a concept in Italian literary criticism. References to, references to the Gothic are generally absent from cinematic depictions of Casanova, from Ettore Scola's Il Nuovo Mondo to 2005's Casanova casting it ledger. However, Fellini's Casanova is full of hints and references to Gothic imagery, and some of these are central in understanding Fellini's critique of, of Italian traditional masculinity as embodied by Casanova. Zapponi was also the author of an eccentric treaty on the Inquisition called uh, Nostra Signora dello Spasimo and published in 1963 that would prove handy in the Inquisition scenes and more generally in the atmosphere of Casanova. And it is precisely this that constitutes the first main Gothic element in the movie. We see Zapponi's influence because we can find it also in movies as diverse as Toby Demit and Satyricon. As, as Federico Pacchioni argues, the infernal atmosphere that is perceivable in Fellini's cinema from 1968 to the end of the 70s owes much to Zapponi's leanings for horror genre, for horror genre, post days, ghost, gothic, and dark and sinister atmospheres. From the first scenes of the film set in a nocturnal Venice, the 18th century is portrayed as uh, uh, a dark, symmetrical space crowded with remnants of a fading civiliz uh, civilization. Casanova himself, a profoundly anachronistic figure, will become such a remnant in the last scenes of the movie. Mm. Fellini's movie is set in the 18th century, which is the century of rationalism, of neoclassicism, but also the century of the Gothic, of course. The movie is almost always set in closed spaces, rooms, uh, palaces, carriages, theaters, and in a, it, and it appears to be almost always night. With this choice, Fellini plays with an idea of Italy as a land of rationality and classical harmony, recovering, uh, recovering on the contrary, a Gothic imagery made of obscure settings, esotericism, witchcraft, and artificial creatures. This attitude, also extends to the physical appearance of Casanova himself, as Fellini explains. Here's a quote from an article uh, by Millicent Marcus. Uh, I mean, Fellini quoted in an article by Millicent Marcus. The true motive of my choice is precisely the lunar face of Sutherland, totally strange from the conventional image that people have of Casanova. The Italian with dark magnetic eyes, raven hair, Sorting complexion, the classic type of the Latin lover, in short, is archetype. And therefore, the operation that I want to perform with Casanova of estrangement or overturning the traditional model is precisely this. Let me see. Okay. By the way, it is worth noting that Sutherland himself was not new. To, uh, to Gothic cinema, as it starred uh, in uh, Ricci and Sabatini's Il Castello dei Morti Vivi in 1964. Uh, according to Zapponi, the Casanova created by him and Fellini is a character who lives permanently in a mortuary dimension made of beds that resemble coffins of funeral apparitions of old women in the putrid greenish color of Venice. 
And of course, these features, uh, his lunar phase, the mortuary dimension, serve to trace a similarity between Casanova and one of the most popular characters of Italian Gothic cinema, the vampire. In Italian cinema from 1959 to 1975, most notably in movies such as Steno's Tempiduri per i Vampiri, uh, which came out in 1959, and Lucio Fulci's Il Cavalier Costante Nicosia Demoniaco, ovvero Dracula in Brianza, 1975, the male vampire functions as a commentary on Italian sexual mores and addresses traditional depictions of masculinity, as well as the rapidly changing sexual, sexual habits. Similarly to the way Steno and Fulci employs, employ the sex appeal of the vampire, especially following the success of Amher's Dracula, to satirize the sexual mythology of the Italian male as an ever-winning conqueror, Fellini's depiction of Casanova's predatory and cataloging sexuality aims to subvert traditional notions of masculinity. And I argue that Fellini is consciously or unconsciously hinting at the popular imagery of the vampire to characterize Casanova as a dispassionate seducer. If the settings, of Casan and, if the settings and Casanova's appearance were not enough evidence, we should also consider Fellini's Casanova as a Gothic movie in a thematic sense too. Casanova is a movie profoundly concerned with the dangers of imitation, or of the simulacrum, to quote Baudrillard, which is the substitution of the science of the real for the real. Casanova's life is not real life, but it's rather a simulation of life, which is a constant in Fellini work, and it's also a theme that we've been seeing uh, recurring in all the presentations of this conference. It is not that Casanova imitates someone, but that theatricality and performance are, for him, more real than reality itself. Casanova is always reciting, uh, is always dressed like he's in costume, is always in pose, is always surrounded by imitations of human figures, like mannequins or the automaton at the end of the movie. Similarly, all of Casanova's sexual performances have and are aimed at an audience. And coherently, Fellini's mise en scène is as theatrical as possible. And for example, as we recalled yesterday, uh, the sea in the opening scene is evidently recreated with plastic. With his stylistic choices, Fellini transforms Casanova himself into a mannequin, is deprived of interiority, and his cost and goal is exhibition. All of Casanova's actions, from lovemaking to poetry reciting, are marked by a mechanical tone. And in this sense, the closing scenes of the movie where, Casan where when Casanova dances with an automaton are revealing. They hint at Sigmund Freud's essay on the Unheimlich, which discusses Hoffman's The Sandman, but they also reprise the imagery of Giorgio Ferroni's seminal Il Mulino delle Donne di Pietra, which came out in 1960, in which women are petrified, turned into mannequins, and placed in a mechanical carousel. Reflections on the dangers of creation are a common concern of Gothic fiction from Mary, Sh Mary Shelley's Frankenstein onwards, and especially in the postmodern Gothic. Very much like Fellini does in Casanova, the Gothic tradition is profoundly concerned with the lack of boundaries between reality and representation, leading to the evanescence of identity and social norms. This ambiguity is greatly emphasized by the typical postmodern schizophrenic separation of the text and the referent embodied here by Casanova himself, which leads to a crisis of social and personal identity that is characteristic both of Gothic and postmodern literature. And this is also coherent uh, with Fellini's choice to treat Casanova not uh, as an historical subject, but as a literary construct, as Millis and Marcus noted. The movie is not based on a biography, but on Casanova's own autobiography, which means a text that is by definition performative. The title suggests this double re-elaboration. In Italian is Il Casanova di Federico Fellini, and we can note that the use of the article in uh, the article Il 
as if Casanova was a character of the Commedia dell'arte, il Casanova like l'Arlecchino, means that Fellini knows he's working with a literary character rather than an historical figure. While Di Federico Fellini, in the title, highlights from the beginning Fellini's own effort to transform its, its subject. Mm. From a ontological perspective, we can say that Casanova is hunted by, haunted by his own ghost, the ghost of his fame, while the entire movie is haunted uh, in a rather gothic fashion by the ghost of Casanova's literary and historical fame. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, uh, Marco. And uh, I'm, I'm now tethering off my phone because my internet has gone down, but uh, so I hope everyone can, can hear and see me all right. Okay, well, last but definitely not least, um, we have Heather uh, Faye McIntyre, um, uh, who, and uh, Faye McIntyre teaches uh, film and literature at the University of Manitoba. Um, she has a special interest in Italian film and um, specifically of the post-war period and has published on Vittorio uh, Di Secca's Two Women and Federico Fellini's Il Badone. And um, she is currently working on a project on uh, Giulietta Messina. Well, thank you so much, um, Heather Faye, and uh, please uh, take the floor before my internet goes down. <laughs> there, can you hear me now? Okay, thank you very much. And thank you to the organizers of the conference as, as well. It's been great. Uh, the title of the paper is Grotesque Pleasures, Federico Fellini's Juliet of the Spirits. Beginning with Il Bidoni, Fellini starts to focus more overtly on the importance of the individual's escape from conventional restrictions. And by the time of his Playboy interview of 1966, he aggressively promoted the idea, being specifically adamant about the importance of freedom from the institution of marriage, which he felt was a tyranny that impeded the artist's spontaneous growth. In accordance with his then romantic ethos of individual liberty, in Juliet of the Spirits, Fellini proposes that Juliet's escape from inhibiting cultural mores would make possible a life of spontaneously experienced sensual pleasures, and therefore facilitate the recovery of the self's original authenticity or virginal personality, as he called it. However, even critics guided by the director's stated intentions for Julieta, who describe her union goal of individuation as being coincident with her liberation from marriage, have acknowledged the real world unlikelihood of the conservative middle-aged heroine indulging in the sensual pleasures ostensibly awaiting her outside the bounds of her conventional marriage. Fellini's engagement with psychoanalysis in Eight and a Half and Julieta, as Frank Burke notes, generates purely symbolic solutions to real problems. In Julieta, though, Fellini is uncharacteristically insistent on his intended symbolic uh, trajectory of freedom for the heroine, and it is not only the contradictory real-world cultural norms which highlight this insistence. More significantly, the disturbing sexualized visions which assail Julieta suggest a surplus of affective meaning and a more complicated logic of pleasure which belie the teleological simplicity of her story of liberation. The fact of Fellini's unusually determined intentions for Julieta is all the more remarkable for a director who's otherwise renowned for his open narratives and his tendency to let his characters go, to leave them free or continuing to wait in the story's end, their fates only ambiguously suggested without moral or ideological judgment. Tullio Keswick notes that in Julieta, Fellini, once a, an analyzer of crisis, comes instead to a definition of morality that is neither vague nor uncertain. In their so-called long interview, he tells Fellini, no one can say that you've avoided a conclusive summary of your intentions. Both Keswick and Germaine Greer identify Fellini's uncharacteristic adamance about Julieta's narrative fate, but they also note a telling overinvestment on Fellini's part, an unguarded enchantment with the images of sensual female figures that are ostensibly so troubling to his heroine. Keswick describes how Fellini seems to veer away from Julieta's story, his wayward imagination fascinated instead by the grotesque spectacle of female sexuality that characterizes Susie and her world. Keswick says, the idea of the film, also a moral tract, is clearer than its form. And in fact, when the character Susie comes on the scene, the pleasure of fantastical evasion overtakes the director. 
Fellini creates a narrative of abstract simplicity in which the libidinous Susie acts as Julietta's Jungian shadow guide, introducing her to a life freed of the internalized restrictions of a conventional education that has distorted her natural passions. Yet complicating her role as mentor in all matters concerning sensual pleasure is the fact that Susie and her milieu bear a shade of uncanny evil, as Hava Alvedi says. Alessandra Carrera has suggested that, generally speaking, Fellini's films have seemed impervious to theory. His images seem to be owned by him and to offer no free space between the images on the screen and the point of view from which the audience are supposed to watch the film. But while his images typically don't crack, to use the phrase Carrera borrows from Deleuze, their formal excesses might seem to imply a fetishist concealment. His grotesque characters of women, accordingly, have been described by Carrera as a very transparent cover-up for the absolute terror of maternal castration, a reading in line with Laura Maldi's understanding of women's role in cinematic representation. However, I would like to argue that the mode of visual pleasure afforded by his eroticized images of women is not a mere cover-up for castration anxiety, but rather indicative of Fellini's search for a new formal expression of erotic transcendence. To contextualize the unusual emphasis on the role of pleasure in Julietta's liberation, we can consider two aspects of pleasure experienced by Fellini's protagonists in his male-centered films. First, Fellini does not imagine <clears throat> excuse me, a simple escape from cultural restrictions for his male characters, but rather sees them as being, as he claimed to be, divided, torn by the need for strictures, which he knew to be integral to the pleasure of transgression. The other related vein of self-awareness regarding pleasure in the male-centered films is an ironic self-consciousness of the inevitable failure of pleasure, and paradoxically, in terms of Freud's convoluted teleology, the pleasure of failure. Carrera contends that Fellini is unrivaled in displaying the pleasures of impotence and says that his conflation of excessive enjoyment, impotence, and boredom is the conceptual kernel of his work. As experienced by his characters, boredom, as absence of desire, is not satisfied by pleasure, not openly offended by displeasure, in the words of Leopardi. His hero's boredom, as such, is informed by the pleasure of knowing that no object of desire is big enough to satisfy the ontological and not just the pathological nature of desire. Despite Fellini's depiction of the subtle psychological and existential intricacies of pleasure experienced by the men in his films, what Aaron Schuster calls the entanglement of the subject in pleasure, in Julietta, he seems to have imagined the figure of Susie as an uncomplicated, symbolic figure of primordial erotic energy, living a life in which pleasure is taken as an end in itself. Fellini's ideology of pleasure, if we can call it that, at least as it concerns the ostensible narrative conception of Susie, seems more simply imagined in Julietta than it is in his earlier works. Significantly, for example, Milo's Susie is bereft of the layers of irony through which she is enjoyed in Eight and a Half as Carla, Guido's mistress. Lena Wertmuller has remarked that this symbol, i.e. Carla, has been portrayed in Eight and a Half as a union of eroticism and irony is a key within Fellini's body of work. To Fellini, she says, the world of the erotic woman was the ultimate ironic game, where the sexual desire was triggered by an inflated sense of irony. However, Susie, an iconic figure of pagan sensuality, is regarded without Fellini's customary distance of subtly controlled irony. Despite the stylistic extremes of her attire and surroundings, she's a seriously conceived figure integral to an exemplary of Fellini's romantic narrative project of recovering an unreconstructed self, a liberated sensuality unbeholden to cultural or religious mores. She's presented as being instrumental in the process of Julia's individuation, twice referred to by the spirit Iris as a teacher in matters of eroticism, whom Julietta should listen to and follow. There are also indications in Milo's performance and in the description of Susie's gestures in the script that she's imagined as having an unself-conscious native authority and a sort of prelapsarian lack of bodily shame. She's described as moving gracefully with an innocent, almost animal-like impudence. Informing the figure of Susie is the idea that pleasure, especially sexual pleasure, ought to be uncomplicated and spontaneous. She embodies a life that is not circumscribed by social codes and mores, but rooted in the natural truth of the body, its impulses and instincts, and its uninhibited seeking after pleasure. 
I fulfill my desires. I don't deny myself a thing. I eat, dance, play, fight, declares Susie. Julietta's psychic journey, guided by Susie, ostensibly involves her escaping social conventions regarding feminine identity, beauty, and sexuality, especially as these are exemplified and mandated by her remote and glamorous mother. Yet paradoxically, for all her being presented as hyperbolically and unconventionally liberal compared to Julietta's mother in terms of her sexual behavior and dress, Susie's image is nevertheless also a codified construct of feminine sexiness and exaggeratedly so. John Stubb sees his flowing boundary pushing forms, especially in the costuming of Susie and her entourage and the design of her house as Fellini straining at the limits of his art form, a way to suggest the mysterious and ineffable dimensions of life. Similarly, Carrera sees Fellini's fantastic costume and design as part of his seeking for signs of vitality everywhere he can find them, especially in decadence. Fellini's delirious ornamentation, then, is not indicative of his postmodern interest in surfaces, but rather, as Hava Aldabi suggests, it gestures towards his paradoxical goal of finding a symbolic form that will facilitate access to pure, uncodified, primal erotic energy. As such, in depicting a hypersexualized Susie, Fellini enlarges the scope of erotic visual pleasure as it has been conceived of in film theory, first by presenting her, her entourage, and her milieu as being generally tainted by a macabre deathliness. The film is haunted everywhere by morbid, disturbing images of age and excess, by Susie's silent grandmother, who mysteriously watches the erotic games played in her cavernous house, by an aging woman who brags about her sexual prowess, calling herself the goddess of vice, by house guest Arlette, who's bent on suicide by a corpse. The house of pleasure that is Susie's villa is also populated by women whose beauty is strangely, almost aggressively garish and indefinably dreadful. As Anya O'Healy notes, in much of Fellini's later work, the relationship between the alluring and the grotesque is one of uncanny fluidity and ambivalence. Because of their association with death and decay, Fellini's images of Susie and her house guests are not easily perceivable as Malvi's passive objects, visually and narratively situated as a source of erotic pleasure that compensates for the threat of castration they pose. Unlike this, Andrea Menuz argues, Fellini seems to give free rein to the primal force of female sexuality, unapproachable except via a form of disorientation. There is as such a notable difference between the appeal of Fellini's images of women and the more commonly described voyeuristic pleasures of scopophilia and narcissism that function to orient the viewer and encourage a sense of visual mastery. Rather than being reassuring objects of visual pleasure for the desiring and or debasing male gaze, the images of women in Julieta offer a unique form of disoriented access, to use Menuhse's words, to unaccountable, repulsive, even disavowable pleasures. Therefore, it seems necessary to widen the idea of visual pleasure associated with the figure Susie to include the concept of jouissance. One of Derek Hook's useful descriptive phrases for the term is an erotics of negativity in which painful stimuli might be impassioned by a negative morbid excitation. It is a pleasure, he says, that takes one beyond the bounds of pleasure to the extreme point where the erotic borders upon death and where subjectivity risks extinction. A more a diffuse scope for erotic uh, jouissance is in fact suggested by the mise-en-scene of Susie's home. First seen when Julietta returns Susie's wandering cat to her, and then again later when she attends Susie's party, during which the hostess encourages her guests to recreate the atmosphere of a brothel. Overall, Susie's villa evokes a sense of eeriness, um, despite the ostensible gaiety and the opportunities for erotic self-abandonment it affords. The ominous chimera and sphinx statues on the outside staircase, the seemingly abandoned car and tall unearthly flowers in the, in the yard, the chaotic louche glamour of the interior, stained glass windows with a peacock design, incongruous 1920s Charleston music, half-clothed guests, sycophantic hangers-on, and an old cowled monk are all to be found in the first scene. In the second, we witness a pretentious, as Burke calls it, new age initiation rite conducted in French, guests in elaborate feathered costumes, the aforementioned corpse, etc. These are only some of the disparate elements that together contribute to an atmosphere at once fascinating, colorful, literally and figuratively, 
and slightly repulsive and off-putting. Susie's milieu is described by Gilbert Salakis as a cavern filled with maddening effluvia as morbid as they are erotic. The affective charge of this world, centered around Susie, suggests a more diffuse and unlocalizable object of unpleasure. Derek Cook provides another useful metaphor of jouissance in this regard. The atmosphere of Susie's world he might describe as a smear of enjoyment that pervades a scene like a noxious odor, almost obscene. Susie's ambient world suggests modes of enjoyment that are characterized by affective disturbances, evoking the responses of disgust or rejection, and perhaps by the wish to disavow the pleasure or to project it onto others. And perhaps Jermaine Greer is right here when she says that Fellini has commandeered Julietta's fantasies and distorted them in his own image. Okay, thank you. Great. Well, thank you so much um, for a really wonderful panel. Um, excellent way to uh, end off the conference. And uh, we've just been joined by uh, Christina Stewart, who is an archivist at the Media Commons um, here at the University of Toronto. Um, and if you didn't get a chance to watch our presentation, we were talking a little bit about uh, the distribution of Fellini films in Canada. I'm um, very much influenced by uh, Nathaniel Brennan's work on uh, promoting neorealism in the United States, and he does an excellent job about how it was advertised and promoted. And in Canada, we have a little bit of a different situation because we had this large influx of Italian immigrants who were bringing over films um, without subtitles and in original language. And um, we have the Mistrangelo collection at the University of Toronto, and Rocco Mistrangelo actually gave an interview a few years ago where he talked about how it was very difficult for him to screen um, a lot of Fellini's films in his theaters because the patrons were more interested in sort of family friendly um, Italian westerns and, and comedy. So that's what we were uh, presenting on. Um, so we can start the Q&A off uh, maybe with the panel and then um, if you have questions for our presentation we'd be happy to answer those as well. So please either let me know you want to talk or uh, just unmute. <laughs> Oh, Frank, go ahead. Yes. You're muted. Um, here, let me. There we go. Yes, I'm better muted, actually. But at any rate, I, I just, uh, I, all I can say, because I would have really questions for everybody, but I just really enjoyed the entire panel. And uh, uh, more than that, I don't want to take up any more time than I did with Guy Madden, but I just, uh, uh, there's so much good stuff. I, I really, really appreciate it. Eleanor, go ahead. Thank you for like all of these papers and Marco, thank you for your paper. Like I think it was great. And I have a question for you. Like I'm not really an expert in like of Gothic movies, like of the period, but like I, I, I'm a little bit more um, familiar with Gothic literature, like Italian and foreign. So I have uh, a question, like since like the representation of uh, female sexuality is part of like the agenda of Gothic, um, like uh, Gothic uh, literature and uh, films as well. So like there is always this male dominated heteronormative agenda in, uh, in this kind of genre. So like even in early Gothic novels, like female sexuality is always suppressed and it is uh, always the male heterosexuality uh, that is used as an instrument of power and evil. Um, so can you elaborate a little bit more on these and like considering also Fellini's representation of heteronormative sexuality, very patriarchal and masculine point of view, uh, in his other films? And also, do you have specific uh, examples from Casanova where like, you can see the influence of Gothic, the Gothic genre in representing this? I don't know if I was clear enough or- Yes, not. yes. Um, I mean, as far as Italian Gothic cinema is concerned, the representation of sexuality is, is, is very interesting because of Italian Gothic cinema, uh, 
it tends to represent a very excessive uh, forms of sexuality for the period. Uh, we're talking about movies from late 1950s and the 1960s. Uh, so, you know, we find, uh, uh, again, sadomasochistic relationships, necrophilia, and so on. At the same time, uh, and there's a rather interesting book that just came out by Michael Garnieri, uh, about vampires in Italian uh, cinema for Edinburgh University Press. Uh, and I was just reading that and he notices that, uh, uh, for instance, a representation of female vampires and of male vampires, uh, and of course the vampire is a very, you know, strong sexual metaphor and explicitly, especially in contemporary cinema after uh, Christopher Lee's performance in 1958, Dracula. Uh, now, you notice is that there is a representation of female vampires as, uh, on one hand, possessing a strong agency, uh, so a strong initiative, as opposed to, you know, the more bland, more, uh, more traditionally, uh, traditionally uh, framed heroine of the movie. Uh, but at the same time that this agency, you know, uh, coincides with them falling in love with the main protagonist and wanting basically to marry him for eternity. So it's, it's actually Italian Gothic cinema as quite a controversial representation of sexualities, both, you know, subversive and conservative. Now, as far as Casanova is concerned, uh, um, I would, I mean, what I wanted to say, you know, with the vampire metaphor is that uh, um, Casanova have certain features of the vampire, but if you think of the models of Casanova, also of Casanova's fame, which is Don Giovanni, Don Giovanni is, you know, a, a mythological figure in late 18th century uh, culture, which has a lot to do with vampires. Uh, if you take uh, Don Giovanni, and if you take Polidori's Lord Ruthven, for instance, you don't find many, uh, you know, you can find several similarities. Now, um, Fellini, Fellini's Casanova is quite explicitly a movie about Italian sexuality, about Italian masculinity, and he states that in several interviews, in several declarations, uh, and so on, uh, uh, that uh, Casanova wants to satirize, uh, uh, you know, the idea of the, you know, Italians are uh, Latin lovers uh, and so on. And, uh, and this is made quite explicitly uh, with, uh, well, you know, every time Casanova has sex in the movie, he has to, you know, display this giant mechanical, uh, uh, bird, uh, which is not, you know, generic bird, but it's rather uh, the male uh, uh, chicken. Uh, so, you know, uh, and that's, of course, quite a quite um, uh, explicit reference to the parodic intent, to the satirical intent of that. Uh, and again, also, you know, in the um, in the competition scene, in the scene in Rome when he has a competition with his, uh, his uh, peasant uh, uh, on, you know, who can uh, last longer, you know, during the intercourse. There's also uh, an end to, you know, exhibition and performance as more important than pleasure itself in Casanova sexuality. I don't know if that's an answer uh, I may have uh, lost my train of thought at some point. Uh, uh, is, uh, it... it's fine. Yes, 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 yes. Great. Um, does anyone ha have any other questions? Okay. Um, oh, yep. Yeah, uh, okay. Uh, Joanna and then Heather can go after. Um, yes, uh, I guess. Um, it's, uh, I don't know if it's a question, but um, it's a curiosity and there is a question in that. And 
um, is both for Eder and uh, Marco. Uh, and um, I'm thinking about how, um, every, well, during uh, your presentation, Heather, uh, I was thinking of a comment uh, by Deleuze that refers to um, Michelangelo Antonioni and how all his films uh, start with the hand uh, of a love story. And then, uh, you know, then the film develops and it goes from there, you know. So from this sort of crisis of, uh, uh, of the affective real, but he calls it a crisis of ero, uh, eros, you know. He brings that in relationship with the fact that in uh, Antonioni's cinema, there is a sort of a, a temporal disturbance, you know, it's sort of like, um, a second uh, a relationship with time and uh, a sort of like um, unresolved relation with the historical. So I was thinking if uh, in this analysis of uh, pleasures, uh, failed pleasures, pleasures leading to death, uh, de a death drive, there is a, a sort of like a very problematic relationship with the historical. Uh, there is, you know, how the sort of the relationship to, with history comes in. And I think that would be more to the point for Marco because you talk about how Casanova is uh, an historical figure, uh, but uh, at the same time is uh, a mannequin without origin. Uh, so there is there too, this relationship with an eroticism that is, um, has become uh, uh, performative and yet uh, is stuck somewhat in time and we could connect it with other things like you are the expert but I would put the vampires together with zombies you know and the notion of the zombie is the notion of the the un undead right uh, the one the, this uh, figure that comes back you know so I think that um, even in this late Fellini there is this um, interesting relationship between the erotic uh, the death dimension of the erotic and the relationship with the historical. So whatever you can think about that, I would like to hear your thoughts. Okay, do you want me, did you want me to go first or? Yeah. or? Yeah. Okay, so well, I, I think that's a wonderful question, by the way, which I, I can't really uh, answer. Uh, but I think this, because this is, I think the first, uh, if we're thinking about Juliet of the Spirits, I think this is the first film in which there isn't uh, a sense that a connection to the spiritual could be um, recovered or entertained or um, it, it is least uh, proven to be broken. And so if you think of Eight and a Half or, or La Dolce Vita, where the religious symbols are are there everywhere and the meeting with the Cardinal in eight and a half, et cetera. It's a failed uh, connection to recover something of that nature. Um, but in Juliet of the Spirits, the, the shift seems to be towards uh, an attempt to graft the spiritual onto the erotic in, in some way. Um, the, and, and I think that's where the occult seems to come in and that goes back to Marco's presentation, I think. Um, the, the, the reaching for something beyond, which is, um, it's kind of horrifying. I mean, if we think of the visitation to Bhishma, for example, uh, the horror of those, um, of that session with, uh, with Bhishma, with the Oracle, and also the, um, the vampiric women in Susie's, during, at Susie's party, which, which also um, are, uh, again, a, a seemingly a kind of reaching for something that's bordering on, on death and, and um, uh, or that, that, that borderline between uh, the erotic and the, and the deathly there, which is, but it, it doesn't seem to, uh, it seems to be just a, um, uh, a, a confrontation with that, that the discarding of or the moving past the traditional spiritual and moving on to something um, that um, partakes of the occult and the entertaining of the horror that comes that possibly with that, if we're, um, uh, and I'm not exactly sure where Fellini is. Uh, there's an interesting um, 
moment for me at the end of the Bhishma section. Uh, and I've always wanted to follow this up and the question of voice in that film, which is so fascinating because as Juliet is making her way out of her session, uh, Bhishma's assistant calls her back for a second and said there's, there's more to the message um, after she says she should treat love like a religion, et cetera. Um, they, uh, where she says that, that you will have a beautiful uh, encounter tonight or something beautiful is, is, is coming in the future. And then as Bhishma's voice is heard through the door, the voice um, alters itself and changes from Bhishma's voice into a voice which I'm quite certain is Fellini's voice. If I'm not mistaken, it, it, it's it has to be his voice, I would think. And his voice seeks out of Bhishma's voice when he tells her about this encounter with Jose to come and um, the magic potion of, of sangria that she's going to be given, which will um, and sort of lift her into this uh, romantic uh, mood that charges, erotically charges her her um, her evening from from then on, so um, uh, it, it, I don't again I don't know where Fellini is in that um, shift from the more traditional spiritual into the occult and its connection to the uncanny the the horrible etc. But you can I think you can hear Fellini's voice making that segue for us in that moment where his his voice is, uh, I believe, actually heard taking over from the voice of the of the uh, spiritual um, advisor. Anyway, I think that's. <laughs> so I'm not sure exactly where that goes, but anyway, it's a wonderful question. So Marco, you. do you have anything to to say as well? Well, I mean, uh, uh, there. There are a lot of things to say, of course. I mean, as the relation, as for the relationship of death and the erotic in in Casanova, um, as you said, Casanova is, and especially in this movie, is both a historical figure and kind of a mythical figure, uh, to the extent that, uh, of course, even in the Italian language, Casanova is no longer, you know, person is just a word. Being a Casanova is just an expression. Casanova was a person heavily dealt with uh, his time's politics uh, and, and literary society and so on, uh, but at the same time, and he details it in, in his autobiography and so on, but at the same time, he became this kind of mythical figure that, you know, in Italian, you either, you either say uh, being a Don Giovanni or being a Casanova, but Don Giovanni is a mythical invention. Casanova was a real person, right? Um, and, uh, and, and Fellini, it, I mean, his intention was to work on, more on the mythical idea of Casanova. Casanova is an archetype of the Italian male, rather than Casanova as an historical figure. Um, and, and I mean, if you, no, if you notice, there, are, there is no history in Casanova in the movie, right? Uh, this is an historical movie in, as far as the atmosphere is concerned, but there are no events. And uh, I don't want this, this comparison to sound disrespectful, uh, but, you know, thinking of Casanova, while I was writing this paper, I often, my mind often went to interview with the vampire. Uh, the, the novel, which actually came out the year Casanova came out. And if you, if you have read the novel of, of, of seeing the movie, you see, always, you know, these characters elegantly dressed, just like Casanova, always in close space, uh, that live in times when very interesting things are actually taking place, uh, but we never see them. We just see them, you know, in interior pieces and showing off their dresses and their clothes at night. So just, just as, I mean, and as far as the comparison between the vampire and the zombie is concerned, uh, uh, of course, they are two figures of the undead. They are in many ways to, you know, they do represent uh, very different returns of the oppressed. 
but I would say that uh, they are characterized by one thing, uh, and that is then definitely the thing that characterizes Casanova, which is compulsion uh, and addiction. Uh, and again, speaking of vampires, I'm thinking of you know the addiction, the amazing uh, movie from the 90s. Um, so that is definitely a, you know something that uh, relates uh, death and the erotic in the movie. I again, I don't know if that's an answer. Probably not, uh, but um, maybe. <laughs> well, thanks. I um, I'll. I think Heather had a question, and then after that, I have a question uh, for Christina. Okay, so this is a question for Kevin. Um, uh, it has to do with boredom. Uh, I'm just um, um, thinking about uh, Fellini's uh, statements about uh, the Beatleoni and, um, of course, the boredom that characterizes their their existence, uh, which we, I guess, we usually or it's usually thought of as being a state of uh, arrested development or adolescence, which he. Um, blamed on the church for for creating, uh, but uh, he also speaks about boredom um, in a way that it, uh, it that suggests that it's a state that he loved. He um, speaks about it uh, in um, one of the interviews, and I've forgotten where, uh, as a, a state in which he's lulled. Uh, into passivity, and um, he says that he hears the knocking of the on the door, the spiritual knocking on the door, and he knows that he has to open it, but he's not going to go and open the door yet. And there's that, um, and sort of like uh, Don uh, John Dunn saying, "Oh Lord, make me chaste, but not yet." Um, there's that sense of um, attenuated pleasure in boredom that is also, I think, associated with creativity. Um, and I believe that Keats associated it with it, uh, that state of boredom also in his uh, Ode on Indolence, that it, that it was a very fertile state as well, not just a state of, uh, of nothingness. Um, so I was just wondering if, if you had uh, perhaps heard of uh, Adam Phillips' book, on kissing, tickling, and being bored, in which he looks at the state, which he says is uh, one of the modes of being that Freud does not actually uh, talk about. So if you, if you had uh, any idea of uh, uh, boredom as, as a more uh, positive, creative state, um, that, I mean, if you, if you, if you think of Evie Loney also, the, the attitude to towards those young men who are terribly, uh, is one of, uh, what Feli said, uh, one of irony and fellow feeling, that, that he had sympathy, and also that, that he himself sort of delighted in, in that boredom, that failure to, or that resistance to adult responsible life, that it was a state of pleasure. Yeah, uh, absolutely. In fact, that, you know, I mean, you bring up a good point in terms of you know, I saw it as in, in La Dolce Vita as being basically, you know, demonstrating three options, three relationships you can have to boredom. But indeed, there is the fourth where, and in the 19th century, like, um, uh, like Baudelaire and some of the uh, other moderns uh, of the period, that's exactly how they saw it as mm -hmm. really it's, it's an opportunity to create. Right? Yeah. Yeah. creative force and it gives them an opportunity it gives them time even to reflect and it's 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 still kind of a resistance to it in a way or it's a reaction to mm -hmm. it but it is in you know i mean again in that period it was something that was to be enjoyed and then became you know a force motrice a motor for invention for creation it, it really kind of it was liberating and I think yeah. that, you know, and that yeah. you can enjoy your boredom, right? And, yeah. um, and so you bring up a really good point um, that, um, and that was something, again, in, in what I was reading, that they did, you know, uh, discuss was they did see it as, you know, as an opportunity to create. Um, and, um, but in La Dolce Vita, that's the, that's, you know, I, 
it, it, that seems to be lacking yeah. in that. But you're absolutely right. I think that's a good point, you know, that you bring up about boredom, though. And uh, I mean, you know, who doesn't enjoy some good boredom? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, no. Luca, if you want to quickly go in, and then I have a question for Christina afterwards. But Luca. Yeah, no, I have a, as, um, a question of someone who's more, I think, acquainted with the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the literary moderns of the late 19th century than, uh, than with Fellini himself. Uh, there is a, something, I, I just, uh, on this discussion of boredom, there is something though, about boredom and, and, and we, et cetera, that at one, on the one hand, yes, you, there is that sort of creative pause. On the other hand, there is also, it's also one of the great symptoms of decadence, right? Of, mm -hmm. of, of cultural decline, which is both individual and, and that of a civilization. And I'm just wondering if Fellini's boredom, if there is an element of that as well, um, in, in Fellini. So if Fellini sort of kind of follows that decadent pattern of, as, as I'm saying, mm -hmm. um, boredom as, as something that is to be uh, valued for the freedom that he grants, but also it's a freedom that is paid at the expense of vitality and, and energy. And mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure who you were... <laughs> Addressing I'll, it, the, who, uh, either either one of you says he's talked about about boredom. I mean, it's on, you know, if, if as I said, if Fellini is kind of following that pattern in some way, or or if if that if he take if he's more sort of uh, uh, isolating the creative dimension of, of yeah. boredom. Yeah, yeah, I, I yeah, I think I I take your point. That's a good point, and I I think there is um, I think that is reflected in the aesthetic changes that you see starting in this in 1965. Um, and again, uh, I, what I was trying to suggest, the church, the search for uh, for other forms, um, the search for energy through form and uh, decadence being one of those sources of, of vital uh, energy, and he always, you know, talked about his films as being uh, first and foremost spectacles, um, and um, the uh, um, you know the making of real life into a spectacle. So, it, and it, the, it seems to be that that going further, as John uh, Stubbs suggests, the you know the um, sort of uh, what. Well, the Rococo fantasies that that he begins to create uh, seems to be a way of wringing, wringing energy out of or, or or you know pushing the formal boundaries of the film to the point where where um, new energy and excitement is is generated by that and I think that comes out of that that decadence to be decadence to uh, boredom but uh, I'm you know that would be um, my sense of his interest in that, in, at least in that period of, of time, if you think about E. Vitaloni and the young, the young uh, Vitaloni as living a sort of decadent life in terms of their um, being unwilling to commit to uh, to the materialistic world of their forefathers, but also uncertain what to do with their fantasies, um, as well as and and being stalled. Um, uh, in the midst of those fantasies. I mean, even there, it's considered uh, a problem because uh, Moraldo is held up as a, as a sort of paragon of, um, uh, mor of morality, I guess you could say, and of the desire to escape that, that boredom, that provincial boredom. Um, but uh, it does it does generate a lot of, um, you know, let's go to Africa, like Hemingway, and, et cetera. It does generate the fantasies that, um, that it, uh, enliven the life of the imagination, so. Thanks so much, Heather. That's Thank really you. Very interesting. Okay, well, just to bring back the discussion um, to we started the day um, with uh, Fellini's influence in Canada with, with 
you know, Guy Madden and, and my, my Winnipeg, um, I wanted to sort of discuss a little bit about with Christina about the um, film collection that we have here at the University of Toronto, and also a little bit about uh, Fellini's uh, distribution in Canada. And, and unfortunately, um, there's still so much research to be done on that topic. Uh, I just had gained access uh, to the Ontario Board of Censor Records as, as COVID hit. And um, uh, the uh, Media Commons Archive, you know, is also have, have limited access. Um, but we have this amazing um, resource of Italian cinema. And there is a, such a strong connection in Canada of Italian cinema. Um, Rocco Mastrangelo distributed Italian films all throughout the country. We had uh, six theaters in Toronto that were just dedicated to Italian um, language films. And Fellini's films did, did play at these cinemas. And he was one of the directors that sort of transcended both audiences. Uh, the Italian Canadian audience, as I mentioned before, you know, sometimes they weren't as interested in his film, and then also the, the art house crowd. And the varsity newspaper at the University of Toronto often mentioned that it was the, Ital the, the Italian circuit was really the only circuit that was showing art house cinema. Um, so Christina, I just, uh, for people that haven't seen the presentation or who'd like to get more information about uh, the Mastrangelo collection at the University of Toronto, if you could uh, say a few words, that would be great. Jessica, hi everybody. Um, so the Mastrangelo collection that we have at the Media Commons Archives at the University of Toronto is uh, quite a large collection actually, and it came in in two separate batches. We have the materials that came from the Toronto office, um, and then we have materials that came in um, about two years after that from the Montreal office. And roughly in each, um, separate donation, there is over uh, 5,000 um, film titles, feature uh, release titles on 35 millimeter. They're 35 millimeter distribution prints. And then we also have um, video masters on um, the three quarter inch dubs that Master Angelo made um, of those films as, as almost um, uh, uh, for preservation, but also uh, for rentals for his for his company. Um, so the collection really, the ones from Toronto, the date range usually for those films is um, the mid, mid to late 60s through to the very early 80s. So it's very heavy in the 1970s um, era of, <clears throat> excuse me, of distribution. And then the, the materials from Montreal are the earlier films. Those typically start in the mid to late 1950s, and then they go through to maybe the mid 60s. So um, it, it, we kind of have a very large uh, range um, of, of Italian cinema. And it's not only features, I mean, it's, the, it's predominantly um, release prints of, of feature films, all Italian language. Um, no subtitles, English subtitles, but also there is um, shorts, there's trailers, there's um, some cartoons, there's, so there's a bit of, quite a bit of range in, in the collection, which is, which is really fascinating. And so because of COVID, we haven't been able to continue our work on it, but um, yeah, I'm looking forward to diving back into it when we are able to get back. Yes, and hopefully next year we can do a presentation part due. Uh, exactly, <laughs> exactly. More, um, uh, information, and you see in, in Canada, uh, it was often difficult for certain areas to get art house cinema. There were film clubs, and there are all these other elements um, mm -hmm. of research. And and could, I know the, the collection hasn't been completely fully assessed because it's just so vast. Um, yeah. But but primarily we're looking at um, sort of, there's more Italian Westerns, comedies. Could you speak to sort of a little bit about the types of films that-, that Right. So for the genres, um, they are pretty, we do have, uh, there's a large presence of, of Westerns, Italian Westerns. Um, and then there is, um, I mean, we haven't delved that much into the collection yet because it's so vast. We're still learning. Every time we dive into it, we're learning something new about it. Um, but at this point, yes, a lot of Westerns um, and um, a lot of um, the adult 
sex comedy kind of genre as well. Um, so, which is fine. Um, so, I mean, it's right now that's kind of what we're seeing because um, uh, the Toronto based collection is what we're diving in first because that's the first donation that came in. So, um, for, for the Montreal uh, materials, we've been told that um, it's more um, art-based, but we're not really quite sure. So um, I guess next year, if we do have a part two, <laughs> we'll be able to shed more light on that. Great, well, do we have any more questions either on that or um, for Giovanna? Could I just ask if the uh, if the videos are rentable uh, through the mail? Like, could you borrow them? Uh, is that possible? So I, I'll let Christine talk about the actual collection. But um, the MVP store is uh, well, as before COVID, is still still around, and it's very interesting. There are people from Italy that often contact me because I posted about MVP uh, to try because there are certain titles that it's the only place that you can find it, um, and the store is. At least it was still in operation as of, of March. Um, but Christina can talk a little bit about the, the Media Commons collection. So, right. So our materials, uh, because they're archival materials, uh, they're not circulating. So, okay. um, but for research purposes, um, you could come in and look at them on site, um, whichever you wanted to see. Um, uh, that's just, that's our policy, yeah. Go ahead, Frank. You're muted. You're muted. I guess I wasn't and I am. Okay, <laughs> dueling mute buttons. Uh, I had heard that MVP had closed about three years ago, nothing to do with COVID. I didn't realize that it was still, is it still on College Street? Yep, yep, it's still there. And, oh, great. Uh, and, and it's still, well, it was, I'm not sure, again, I don't know since, since yeah, we're yeah. Is actually he's he has been in you know poor health, but um, uh, it was still open, uh, and and I believe you know you can try calling them to see if they're still <laughs> still around as of now, but they are still open. That's great news. Thank you, um, Marco. I think you have a question for. Yes. Um, yeah, I do have a question for Giovanna. Um, well, I mean, first of all, I well want to thank you for your uh, for your presentation, which was really great, and I really appreciate you. You, that you used uh, uh, Baudrillard in your reading of Ginger and Fred, with, uh, with an author that seems to be kind of, you know, uh, popping up uh, quite frequently in this conference. And I mentioned it briefly. Uh, Bravadelli yesterday did not mention him, but, you know, seemed quite, uh, quite appropriate. Uh, it seems appropriate also in reference to Eleonora's uh, paper last week about, you know, the theatricality of Fellini and so on. So I just wanted to ask if you could elaborate on that and eventually, uh, you know, if you wanted to expand your reading uh, of Ginger Fred uh, to other movies of Fellini, what would you choose? Uh, and, and so on. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Marco, for your words and, um, and for your question. And I absolutely agree. I think the concept of the simulacrum is something that's very present, especially in a postmodern film like Ginger and Fred, and, and of course, throughout uh, Fellini's entire oeuvre, but uh, of course, towards the end. Um, but in terms of looking back, I think the most pressing thing to comment on here, and I, I touched upon it briefly during the presentation, um, was to kind of make this um, connection with Luci del Varietà. And I say this because I think Fellini's um, issue with the postmodern, especially with uh, commercialization and capitalization that was happening in 1980s Italian society most predominantly was the fact that you're kind of losing this originality and the, this concept of um, almost religious experience when going to the cinema. And so by watching television, it's basically another simulacrum in many ways to watch a film on your television screen when it's not actually that real experience, but 
it's a new reality that we're living in, especially today with things like Netflix or uh, Prime Video or these streaming services from home. Um, and especially, unfortunately, uh, because of COVID, we, we are forced uh, to do this now. Um, but going back to the original point of, of uh, looking back to Luci del Varieta, I think he made that so pressing first for his protagonist, because of course, to have his two for me anyways, two main personaggi of Fellini films, which are Giulietta Mazzina, who I'm very, very partial to, and uh, Marcello Mastroianni. And to bring them together in that way is particularly special for the concept of the self-portrait, but then to resemble another time and to show that, you know, we need to go back to the original in many cases and start to look for that original and provide a soul back into um, what um, Fra uh, Franco Galipi mentions in his article as well. Uh, he, there's this need for a mythologization again, to reinvigor what's happening. Um, in, towards the end of your question, you were mentioning some other connections with other films. My goodness, I think all of Fellini's films at this point, and it's been so uh, incredible to have been a part of Professor Zambenedetti's monographic course, of course, which you were in as well with me this past, um, this past year, um, to experience Fellini's films in such a way that truly define how interconnected they are. And that the more Fellini you watch, like for instance, you could watch Ginger and Fred just as Ginger and Fred and still receive the most incredible messaging. However, when you watch Ginger and Fred or any other Fellini films in conjunction with his entire oeuvre and his works, and this is actually something that um, Professor Burke mentioned so wonderfully in his work uh, for the centenary as well, uh, Federico Fellini's films and commercials, where you truly see how interconnected everything is and how much more you gain from it. So I don't know if I've answered your question fully, but I hope I was able to contribute somewhat to that. And I thank you again for that opportunity. Thanks so thank much. Thank you so much, Joanna. Uh, Frank, and then we'll, we have a question from Eleonora, but uh, we'll have, Frank, you can go first. Okay, this is the, this is the book of uh, the collection of, um, of all the books that were found in Fellini's library. And he's got, he's got two books by Baudrillard. And uh, I do talk a lot about Baudrillard, both in 1996 and then more in terms of the commercials um, in my more recent book. But yeah, Baudrillard is absolutely crucial. And the thing that was so amazing, not only that Fellini had the books in his library, but also they were, Baudrillard was writing at the same time that Fellini was making Ginger and Fred, for instance. So it was really in the air. And I think Fellini, Fellini not being somebody who studies and applies, but somebody who just absorbs it uh, and reproduces, uh, I think, yeah, absolutely, Marco of Baudrillard's up fundamental to Fellini's later films. Great. Well, Eleanor, I had a question about um, someone in Kensington Market who sells um, Italian cinema posters. And yeah, the Royal was actually um, uh, run, Rocco Mastrangelo operated that theater. And um, I do know they still have several posters at MVP, so I, I, he may be connected. I don't know if, if Christina has any information about him. And I know that there's also, um, Christina mentions the poster collection as well in our presentation on YouTube, if you haven't seen it. Yes, thank you, Eleanor. That's great information. I, um, we, in the presentation, we were to, um, there was somebody who, who got the poster collection and was supposed to um, create uh, some sort of exhibit museum uh, devoted to Italian cinema posters and imagery and art. Um, and then because of there's, you know, typical with, with movie posters, there's usually tons of duplicates. Um, and we were supposed to get um, the duplicates um, after, after this person went through uh, the entire collection. And we haven't received <laughs> any word. Um, so um, I saw somebody selling, I don't know if it's the same gentleman, I saw somebody selling um, um, a large quantity of Italian posters at um, the Toronto uh, paper show um, last mm -hmm. fall. 
and haven't and was just wondering if that if those were part of this so i'll check this out but thank you very much yes and i might have some information for you on that uh uh but i can i can tell okay. you okay <laughs> thank you <laughs> not streaming on the internet um but alberto has a question for for marco yeah thank you it's a question for marco but it also can actually connect um Giovanna's paper uh, in some way. Um, it's, you know, Marco, you know, I have a great affection for Casanova and Frank knows this too, of course. Uh, and I've been, th and it's a movie that I've been thinking a lot about a lot. And um, it, I love the fact that Juliana brought up the question of the undead, you know, these figures of, you know, being undead and that you have responded that the undead has this kind of, you know, addiction is the hunger, right? That's the, the hunger for something. Um, but there is in Casanova another f form of of undead, uh, which is the automaton. Um, and the automaton, you know, not not it's it's the paradox of the automaton is that it's both, you know, like the undead, it's both alive and and uh, dead because it's you know it's made of dead matter and yet it lives, yet it moves. And in Hoffman's tale, you know, the Sandman, the the precisely the oscillation between these two poles is what drives the main character to mess, right? You know, the, the not being able to recognize whether something is alive or dead, you know, not having, losing those moorings essentially, you know, ends up in madness, which of course the figures of, uh, that are undead like the vampire or the, or the, or the zombie, you know, don't have that issue. Um, uh, it, and it's a question of kind of like, it, then it becomes a question of awareness, right? Um, so I, I wonder if um, if you can sort of like triangulate um, Casanova with that figure, with the figure of the automaton, because I, I, you know, to me, the figure of the automaton is the figure that actually discloses, you know, the prof profound meaning of Casanova um, and the ultimate affection that Fellini came to feel for this character that he loathed for a long time. Um, and it happens, of course, in the in the last frames of the film where Casanova himself becomes be, himself becomes, you know, a figure of uh, of a certain kind of automation that was also, of course, one of the main concerns of the 18th century. Right. That's when the automata and, the, the, you know, the automaton uh, of the automata, you know, became uh, objects of, of 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 interest. Uh, in their precisely in their uh, in their uh, spectacle of animation that left people kind of like uncertain of whether that was real or not. You know, think about the Turk, the famous Turk, uh, with the chess player in Turk. Um, you know, a wonderful con you know contraption that turned out to be in fact uh, fake in that because it was there was a person animating it and providing in fact the, the chess playing skills that the that the you know mechanical pulleys inside the automaton was not were not actually able to perform but so the automaton as a figure of the 18th century you know i think uh, has that oscillation right that's almost like a fetishist oscillation in terms of you know in the terms of manoni put it like i know it's not alive but yet right i know it's or you can reverse it i know it's not dead but yet you know i kind of want to believe that it's alive or i want to believe that it's dead um so to me that's kind of uh, one of the ways in which Fellini solves the problem of the 18th century, of the great contradiction of the 18th century, where, you know, you, you, uh, you have rationalist, uh, you know, the birth of certain kind of like empiricism and rational thoughts, you know, in light, as you called it, it's the enlightenment after all. Uh, but yet you have this interest, continuous and pernicious interest in the occult, you know, that traverses romanticism, you know, touches decadentism and, and then, you know, arrives uh, even in the, you know, even in the 20th century, you know, through figures like Fellini and Zapponi who were ultimately, you know, fascinated and interested with some degree of irony, perhaps, but um, that uh, that's also very present in, in, in Casanova. And if, you know, I, this is long, kind of like a long-winded question and observation, but I also feel that if you vault, you know, from one century to the next, you find that particular kind of, you know, irony and, and perhaps skepticism, but also, uh, Understand, understand, you know, um, understanding that there is some this some inevitability to that uh, in the uh, sort of like the media genealogy that you you that that Giovanna is traced, you know, from going to the film, 
you know, to television. Eventually, you know, Fellini will not participate in that, but it would be fascinating to know what he would have done with the streaming services and, and so on and so forth. Um, so, yeah, if you have any comments on that, and I apologize yeah, for the I mean, there are uh, um, a lot of things to say, and of course, the, I mean, the figure of the automaton, uh, which is not a doll, which is not a mannequin, it's an automaton, is, um, is, it's quite, you know, it's quite a complex topic uh, and it is a central topic in Casanova. And it is true that the automaton is not, uh, you know, an inherently Gothic topic. Of course, the Gothic is very much concerned with the dangers of creation, of artificial creation, of literary creation and so on and so forth. But the automaton itself is not. On the other hand, the automaton is the object of, uh, you know, Hoffman's The Sandman, which is the object of Freud's uh, essay on the uncanny. And it would be very interesting. I mean, of course, I guess, it's my guess, Zapponi had read uh, Freud. It would be interesting to know if Zapponi had read uh, Todorov. Uh, because, of course, Todor Todorov's reading of Freud... Uh, and use of the category of the uncanny is, you know, largely based on that essay. And the book came out in 1970 and was translated into Italian in 1977 and will be the base, you know, of the whole debate on the fantastic in the following decade. But, you know, if Zapponi had read uh, uh, Todorov in French, I, I don't know about that. It would be interesting to find out. Um, it is also true that, you know, the vampire and uh, um, the automaton are two different things, uh, but it is also true that they kind of both share the ambiguity, you know, between, you know, us being unable of distinguishing if they're alive or if they're dead. Uh, um, so in that sense, the final scenes of Casanova could be interpreted in, you know, several ways. Uh, on one way could be, you know, Casanova finally finding this perfect woman uh, because it's, you know, it's fake. It's a fake woman and it's uh, perfectly controllable uh, and so on. But could also be of Casanova finally finding someone like himself. Uh, so, you know, the automaton is, I wouldn't read it uh, as uh, Casanova's idea of femininity, but rather as Casanova's idea of, of himself, if that's correct in your if, if, if I may, like, I, I don't, you know, I guess what I was trying to suggest is Alberto, your internet's a bit. My, oh, so frustrating. Can you hear me? Not, you're kind of, you're frozen. Maybe we'll give Alberto a second to unfreeze. Frank, did you want to say something? Here, here. Oh, actually, I mean, I, w I wasn't, but but. Oh, I, sorry, I thought you were. No, no, but I will. I would. The thing that just occurs to me from everything that Marco is saying, the same thing happens at the end of City of Women as well, that uh, the balloon, you know, the automaton turns into the balloon at the end of City of Women, and the balloon is really a reflection. It's not Baraz. It's not a reflection of any kind of meaningful otherness whatsoever. So. It comes back again in that respect. I think I'll go it back. So, yes. What do, uh... Nice. This is too frozen. Back on. Can you hear me? We yes. can hear you, but I think you might be frozen, but we can hear you. Now it's okay. working. I apologize. Yeah. Uh, my Zoom crashed. 
Um, I guess I was trying to suggest that perhaps, uh, you know, um, and a possible understanding of that final image is in a, is as a Deleuzian crystal image where you, you know, which is an image where, you know, the past based on Bergson's theory of, you know, of time and present that um, it's a, it's a, it's an image where the past and the present um, are uh, re represented and re you know, representable sort of like simultaneously. Um, so in, in, in that respect, you have, you know, all of the, you know, the experience and the, um, and the, the persistence of Casanova's iconicity um, crystallized into uh, one little image that significantly is just uh, sort of like a carillon that can, you know, revolves uh, forever and ever, uh, uh, you know, if you continue to hold the, the spring right which could which are the sort of like the cultural gyrations and the cultural iterations that produce this this particular kind of like everlasting movement you know attached to the figure of casanova so that's why I, you know i felt that the automaton uh, is, is uh, perhaps the, the most important character in in the film despite the, you know the fact the fact that it may or may not be a sentient character um Anyways, I, I will stop here because I could talk about this for too long. And just to, to answer very quickly to the, the other part of your question, well, of your comment uh, about, um, you know, the automaton as a symbol of the ambiguities of the 18th century, as a, you know, time of rationality and uh, at the same time of, you know, interest in the occult and everything. Uh, it is very much so, and I think it's one of the interesting things that Fellini did uh, with his Casanova movie was to recover all these, you know, patrimony of uh, images and of idea dealing with the uh, cultural interest uh, of the 18th century that, of course, are the same uh, cultural interest of, you know, 1970 Italy. Uh, to, you know, kind of try to contradict uh, the, you know, widespread idea that uh, Italy had no Gothic tradition and so on. And so, you know, kind of trying to build an, alterna an alternative genealogy of, you know, the Gothic in Italy through Casanova. So that's, that's my point. And I'll just, uh, Giovanni. Giovanni, yeah. you have to say, yeah. If I could add very briefly. So, um, Professor, thank you for the question as well. I think um, in terms of the occult culture in the time of Ginger and Fred, just to return it back to the film in the postmodern, um, would then be a discussion of the occult as mass media culture, which is what, of course, Fellini's most um, irritated about in the film. And... Um, with that being said, I think he's showing us, there's actually a particular scene that um, I can recall that I was thinking about yesterday as well in, in the film, where Amelia, so uh, Giulietta Mazzina is on the phone with her daughter and she's basically expressing how frustrated she is and how angry she is. And then at one point she says to her daughter, she goes, no, don't worry about me, I'll be fine. I'm gonna watch some TV and be calm. So it goes back to this concept of at this point, we're all at that era, and even more so now with social media. I think this automatonness has is not represented necessarily by one figure in the film. Rather, it's something to be shown as innate within all of the figures present. And I say that because it's a result of the culture. The culture has imposed this piece of the automaton inside of, of each of the protagonists there. And it's interesting because the television now is something that is basically to bring you to another reality, to not realize the reality that you're in. And I think this is exactly what Fellini is trying to warn uh, the viewers about. Um, but I did want to also touch briefly upon the concept of the streaming services that uh, Professor Zamanadetti was mentioning. And I, I've actually, over the past few months with COVID, have been really reflecting upon a question like that and saying, you know, I wonder what Fellini would have done, like, especially when I sit and watch something on Netflix and I use the remote to flip forward, I say, oh, Fellini would hate me for doing this. But um, 
you know, I think that the concept of streaming services and, and uh, watching films on the computer or on one's phone, even more so, where we're making the screens much smaller and that religious aspect, like Fellini describes, of going to the cinema, seeing this big screen with these ginormous figures, um, almost haunting the audience with that, with that uh, sentiment, it becomes much more difficult. Although with Netflix and streaming services, commercials are no longer really present, which would interrupt the films. Um, this doesn't necessarily take away the remote from the spectator. And I think it's the combination of the two that if there's one or if there's other, it's not something that he would have agreed with. Um, but again, I would have loved to have been around while Fellini was still around doing these interviews about Berlusconi and about those who have the remotes in their hands. Um, but I do believe that in terms of the experience, it's, it just makes it a lot different. Like if we talk about pre-COVID time, which seems so, so far in the past uh, nowadays, but it kind of makes things sad because immediately with cell phones, your phone rings, you pause and you break that continuity of the film. Or, you know, you have, Fellini mentions, you know, you have your mother-in-law yelling and you got to see what she's up to. So the streaming services, I think anytime you're bringing it home, Although he thought it might have been a good idea, I'm sure, and, and Professor Burke might uh, want to correct me if I if I err on this, um, with films like Director's Notebook for NBC and then um, Toby Diamond for Dry, and you know he figured, well, I could be even closer to those in the home and be even more spiritual in that sense because what's greater than home, right? In that sense, but. Um, he, he found out rapidly that there would be some issues with that. So that's that's my two cents on the question. I hope I was able to contribute. Thank you. Well, thanks so much, Giovanna. That was really um, great. So I, I know we're a little bit past the Q&A, so I just want to put it out there. If people need to leave, um, feel free to, um, yeah, so it, feel free to just uh, head out. Um, but we do have a little bit more time built in for maybe some socialization. I know uh, Eleonora has another um, question. So one of the one of the things that we we can do for the um, last little bit, um, one of the things that's missing at conferences is that we don't really have that time to have um, you know small group discussions with people. So that's why we kind of built in this idea of of breakout rooms. So what we can do is put everyone in a breakout room with with uh, two or three people and you can sort of get to know each other. Or if people are interested in continuing the Q&A, we're, we're happy to do that. So I can um, uh, leave it, leave it to, to you for, for what uh, we would like to do next. Eleonora, did you wanna ask your question? Uh, sure, thank you. Uh, I have a question for Marco and Ether. I was thinking about your presentation in relation also to mine and the, the idea of the grotesque and, uh, and the esoteric. And I was thinking about two scenes specifically, one from Giulietta degli Spiriti and the other from Casanova. And the one from Giulietta degli Spiriti is the one in which she's talking with the guru and she's receiving these um, teachings on how to uh, to please her husband and how to to be better at having sex and there is this comedic bit in which uh, the guru teaches her how to make all these animal sounds and if i remember there is a chicken and it's quite like funny and out of pace with the rest of the atmosphere and the other scene from casanova uh, that i was thinking about is when there is one of the noblemen during one of the, the dinner and he has this moment in which he performed this dance and this song in which he's dressed as an insect and at the end of the dance there is this uh, sexual encounter that is not really clear if it's, um, if it's a sort of like abuser but but there is this the, the man dressed as an insect having sex with a, with a young dancer and and I was thinking if uh, you you think that this is correct to see an element of uh, irony and this sort of ironic detachment 
and in Fellini towards the, the, the genre of the, the esoteric themes and the, the, the gothic genre. It, there, is, there is also like a, a sort of comedic distance, if I'm seeing correctly, and what do you think about this? Thank you. Um, well, one thing that the, um, the, the session with Bhishma um, suggests is that the bird sounds that are that are um, uh, in that part of that part where, where we see all of her uh, her his uh, assistants making the um, the sounds there is a there is a kind of uh, comedy or a co comedic tone to that because Juliet is responding with little smiles and little gestures etc um, and that tone is going to change very quickly uh, as, as perhaps Olaf takes over Bhishma. We don't know exactly what happens there. Um, but there's all, uh, th those, um, um, uh, that, that advice about lovemaking that Bhishma gives her is taken directly from the Kama Sutra. Like it is, uh, those are um, close, uh, close to quotes from, from the Kama Sutra. Um, work and, and so it's very difficult to say uh, for other reasons too that that advice is not um, um, taken with I, I mean it seems within the context of this very this very prim um, um, middle class woman's life it's it there is a kind of absurdity about it that's that's sort of cute um, but Excuse me for just a second. Um, that's okay. Um, so, uh, I'm sorry, I'm very distracted. <laughs> My husband just came home with the groceries and I, <laughs> I'm very distracted. But there's also a connection to uh, the animal sounds and the, the connection with uh, women's sexuality and animality later with Susie as well, which I think is taking taken much more um, I, I think there's a, uh, a sincerity about that that is, uh, for example, the, the, the sort of cliched image of the cat that Susie is associated with. She has a dog in her bed. She's associated with a horse, etc. I think that there's, um, that that's part of that effort that uh, Bram Dijkstra, I don't know if you know Bram Dijkstra's Idols of Perversity, to associate feminine sexuality with the animalistic, um, not, uh, to codify it in a way that, that um, makes it apprehensible and enjoyable, even though it's beyond the bounds of conventional or traditional ways of thinking. Um, about feminine propriety or sexual propriety. So uh, my sense is I can't tell, um, um, but I, uh, my way of reading that was to suggest that that is Fellini going into that, uh, you know, going across those borders, ostensibly with Ju Julietta, like um, uh, um, through Susie pushing her towards those, um, uh, more um, um, extreme, wild um, behaviors, let's say, but, but there's something of um, sincerity in that too, even though there's, it's, it's comic at that point. And I think Juliet, Juliet gets, get up, gets up and leaves with a great deal of dignity uh, after that. She's shaken and horrified by it. But I think um, there's, uh, there's a way in which she has maintained something there too, which is, which is admirable. So I'm not sure that she's just ridiculed for her primness, for her inability to uh, uh, connect to that, um, uh, those aspects of sexuality. And in the script, in fact, Susie says, you're just a little bourgeois housewife. You can't even accept your husband's cheating on you without crying, etc." And that, that is not uh, undermined with irony in any way. It's a, it's a criticism that stands. So I, I'm, you know, and for thinking about those, uh, that introduction of her to these, these, uh, 
out, out their um, sexual desires. I'm not sure that Fellini isn't in some ways serious about that, even though there's a comic element to the, the first part of that that scene uh, that she that he that he sees her the film sees her as in some way limited by her ability to cross over that that border you know marco did you have uh, something to say yes thank you i mean uh thank you for your question now it's correct me if i'm wrong you're asking if there is uh, from that scene of the you know the cantata uh, if we can say that there is an element of irony in the representation of Gothic elements in, in Casanova. Yeah, that, right? that scene and, and others, that I think maybe it's the most comedic that I can think of of that film. Because but for instance, in general, that, scene, the, the, that scene in particular, I wouldn't say it's, it's of course a very comical scene, it's riddled with, with comical elements, but I wouldn't say that it's ironic towards the Gothic, but rather towards melodrama. Uh, since, you know, we have these characters in costume singing each other's, well, he's singing, the, 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 the Duke is singing uh, about his, his love and so on, which is, of course, a reference to melodrama and opera, which were the main Italian cultural exports of the time. Uh, and which were also what uh, we kind of remember of Italy, Italian culture of the time in terms of, you know, public uh, uh, of, of a cultural memory. Now, um, and I would say that that scene in particular is just another way that Fellini has to kind of oppose uh, that uh, light, uh, almost comical, uh, you know, side of Italian culture, which is actually, if, if you remember, which is staged for a foreign audience, um, in opposition with, uh, you know, Casanova's, again, dark, nightly uh, manners uh, and habits. Uh, uh, and of course, again, we're talking about Fellini, so we're talking uh, always about the grotesque, uh, uh, and even Casanova's love affairs in the movie have a lot to do with the grotesque and with the monstrous. Where is all the the the, the scene with uh, the giant, the giant woman in London, for instance? Uh, uh, and uh, again, this is something recurrent in Fellini, but of course, monstrous femininity is also a key feature of the Gothic novel. Uh, as we actually recall, uh, as we noticed earlier in this conversation, and of the monsters as something that, you know, patrols the borders of the possible and of what's socially allowed. Uh, more generally, I would say, yes, I mean, generally speaking, yes, there is irony as everywhere in Fellini. On the other, I mean, Fellini, believed or at least claimed to believe in the occult in you know there is um uh, uh, um there are references to spiritualism and to the possibility of talking with the dead which are again presented in a rather comic fashion and we see casanova trying to you know faking it in order to get the money from from uh, this old widow or, or whatever. And so, yes, that's a comical nod. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, Fellini, again, kind of believed in this stuff, or at least said it believed in this stuff, which, you know, is also significant. I don't know if I, if I answered your question or I was. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. Thank you. No, thank you. Great. Do we have any last uh, questions? Uh, uh, Kevin, do you want to? Say something. Yeah, I just want to say that um, that the with uh, Casanova, for example, is and the the notion of the automaton, and also uh, talking about the undead. Um, that seems to me to work well in with La Dolce Vita in the sense that I've always had the feeling 
that the characters in that film were more like zombies, that they were soulless, that they're just these mechanical, uh, empty material things. And it seems to me that it, if, if I remember, that was sort of like what Fellini wanted to do with Casanova, show how empty he was, sort of how mechanical he was, so that he does identify with the automaton. Um, so that, um, again, there's sort of this, the idea of the soullessness, I guess, of, of being, of who we are today, I think, uh, is, ties in with, there's a certain continuity in his work that that we see uh, throughout, you know, until the end. Well, I mean, that's that's definitely true. I mean, Casanova in many ways is not too different from many uh, other characters in Fellini in the sense that it's driven by compassion, compulsion, meaninglessness, uh, and uh, and so on. So, yes, I would tend to agree with that. Uh, Casanova in many ways is just more explicitly pointing to that uh, and is even, you know, programmatically, uh, we could say so. I mean, that seems to be, to have been Fellini's aim in making the movie. So, uh, so yes, I, I would totally agree. And while you were, you know, presenting your paper, I was actually thinking that there, there are a lot of similarities between the two movies. Thank you. Great. Well, that was just, it's been a fabulous day today. Um, we've had some amazing presentations and um, I think I'm going to sort of officially uh, uh, call it to a close, but we can, we can stick around on Zoom a little bit longer um, if, if people want to, you know, say hi to each other. Um, but I really, really appreciate everyone's papers today and uh, Guy Madden's keynote. It, it's just been um, a great experience for me this year uh, to be working on this conference and you know sadly we weren't able to do it in person but I think um, we've been able to have some really great conversations and we've also been able to connect with people all over the world so that's a great thing too. Just <clears throat> if I can just uh, I wanted to add something to the presentation about, about the Mastro Angelo collection yeah. um, um, and I don't know perhaps you're aware of it but in um, the Montreal based uh, uh, filmmaker Paul Tana yes. is making a film about uh, the um, uh, you know uh, interviewing people how when and how they first met Fellini that I think is a sort of a reflection about uh, you know the arrival and the impact uh, of Fellini um, on uh, you know Canadian specifically Montreal culture uh, but perhaps it's something that uh, would be interesting to keep in mind if uh, you know for a reflection about this uh, uh, encounter, you know, between uh, Canada and the culture around Fellini that developed in the, you know, not just the uh, cinema world, but the sort of within the Italian community and, you know, um, I mean, I've not seen the film yet, uh, but um, I think it might be something to keep in mind. Yes, I've actually had some conversations with Paul, um, and uh, part of my project was also uh, to interview uh, people, but unfortunately uh, with COVID, we've sort of had to put a hold on that, but that's something that I'm also planning to do. And one of the interesting things um, in related to with Fellini um, and, and cinema memories, I'm not sure, I'm sure many of you are aware of the Italian Cinema Audience Project, their book was just released, and one of the things they found, um, specifically a lot of Fellini films, is that there's also prosthetic memories that people have about specific film makers that they're then, then they then are able to extrapolate. Well, that's not exactly what they um, remembered. So yeah, I know Paul's, I'm, I'm hoping to uh, be able to speak more with him as uh, hopefully things um, open up eventually and I can, I can restart the project. But thank you for, for, for that comment. That's really um, helpful. Does anyone else wanna say any final last words? Well, I just wanted to thank everyone. Sorry for jumping, if I was jumping on somebody. Um, I, my connection is unstable again. I hope you can hear me. Yes, I wanted to thank hear. everybody. I wanted to thank Marco. It's been wonderful teaching the Fellini course with you. I wanted to thank Jessica. It's been wonderful to teach the Fellini course with you, uh, although we're not done yet. Mm -hmm. I want to thank Giovanna for taking the course. I want to thank Ilonora for having been such a great colleague. I want to thank Frank for having been 
the only keynote speaker that stuck through the, the entire conference and always, always had something really insightful and meaningful um, to say. And I wanted to thank all of the panelists for, you know, the excellent job that they've done and for just, you know, sticking with this uh, complicated juggernaut of a conference. And I hope you got uh, something out of it. And we'll be in touch, of course, for, to see if there's, we can get more out of it um, in the long run. Thanks, Thanks again. It's thank been a wonderful journey. Yes, thank you, everyone. Thank you for organizing. You know, thank you for the organizer and to make this real, um, you know, compelling, alive, and, and uh, you know, very interesting. So, um, you know, that was great, um, great event. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you all. Bye. 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 Ciao.